So I only mentioned it 17 or 18 times so far, but for number 19, remember to follow the plan and adhere to the scope when you've def when you've got this security assessment in progress. You've got to stick to it because when you don't stick to it, it's going to come out almost certainly during the process, but if not in the deliverables. You do not want to incorporate into your deliverable a declaration that you hacked this system or you, you targeted that system or you penetrated using this or that approach if it's outside of scope or if it wasn't part of the plan. That's a really, really bad thing to do. So most often, companies tend to want deliverables in two forms. They want a written assessment, they want a document, and they want a presentation of that document. I'm going to talk about both of those right now. A written security assessment can take a lot of different forms. Ultimately, it's almost certainly going to be in some type of, of document, Word or PDF or something like that. I find that it's going to flex a little bit based on the client, based on the target of deliverable, you know, who wants it, what they want it to do, whether they want it to feed back into IT or they need it for compliance, whatever it is. But this kind of basic framework, what I've got here is a sample table of contents for a written security assessment. And I almost always start with an executive overview, two or three paragraphs on here's what the security assessment was about. Here's what happened at a very, very high level. And here's the results at a very, very high level. Then I'll start getting into details around why was the security assessment engaged in the first place exhaustive definition of what the scope was and what it wasn't, ex specific exclusions or inclusions, what the methodology and the plan was, how I actually approached this kind of attack, what the tests were that I actually did and didn't do, uh, not always with details of time and date and location and latitude and longitude and all that kind of stuff, but some detailed information about the tests, results of those tests, and then conclusion, conclusions of what I should have found versus what I did find or conclusions around where to spend security stuff and that and actually security assets rather. And that really gets into recommendations and next steps, conclusions and recommendations and next steps. Sometimes clients want the recommendations and next steps. Sometimes they just want you to present your conclusions and allow their own teams and their own groups to determine recommendations and next steps. So again, part of the scope, part of the early definition should be, is the client looking for both all these tests, the results of the tests, as well as recommendations for improving security in certain areas, or do they not want that information? And it's actually kind of difficult, to be honest, to deliver a written security assessment in a lot of areas without stepping over the boundary and making recommendations. When you find a specific vulnerability and it's super, super easy, it was just, you know, a cakewalk to get into this particular asset or a cakewalk to compromise that particular thing. It's really easy to say, you know, for, for just a few bucks or for just a little bit of effort, you could make this super secure. That may be what they want to hear. And that's great. And a lot of clients want that as well as they want it prioritized either by cost or, or by timeline or by vulnerability. But you need to know what to do there. Otherwise, I pretty much use this table of contents every time. And it's, if you notice, it's linear based on why the assessment was engaged in the first place, what the early thinking was and definitions were, how I planned it out, what I did, and what happened during what I did. And based on my experience as well, there's a few things you want to avoid when you're presenting a written security assessment. You want to kind of avoid insulting people. It's really, really easy to step into the realm of Joe should have had the firewall locked down properly or the firewall team failed to secure their firewall against this type of attack and I waltzed right in. Well, depending on how you word it, that can actually be a slam, especially if the firewall team is going to read this report that you've written. You're probably not going to make people very happy. And if you're if they're really unhappy and angry and defensive they're not going to accept your input and they're almost certainly not going to remediate the stuff that you're doing. And the whole reason for doing this ethical hacker process is so that they understand the vulnerabilities and remediate against them. Whenever possible, avoiding specific names, avoid nouns. Don't say Joe, don't even say firewall team. Just it's about the firewall or it's about the vulnerability. It's not about a team or an individual. Most of the time that's appropriate. 
However, based on the scope, it may actually be an important thing to mention names. Using visual aids like flowcharts or diagrams to show processes uh, helps a lot to simplify what you're doing in a way that people that read the report understand. I use those frequently when they're appropriate. This one here is another interesting aspect, and it's one that I find a lot of, of ethical hackers fall into the uh, trap of is just reporting negative results. I Here's all of my tests that I've done, and here's the ones that failed for you. Or here's the ones that you had weaknesses on. It's not about that. It's really about having this kind of empirical analysis. These are the things I did. These are where, these are the areas where my tests succeeded or your security succeeded and thwarted my attacks. These are the areas where my attacks succeeded, but then I couldn't do anything with them potentially. Reporting both sides of that equation helps balance most reports and makes them more palatable so people know what you tested and that some of it stood up well. And that goes hand in hand with highlighting the ups and the downs, highlighting the strengths of network security and the weaknesses to ensure that people understand where they're not spending enough money or putting enough focus and where they're probably already doing enough, more than enough in many cases on the security side and don't continue to reinvest there or reemphasize that aspect. And finally, aligning all of the assessment conclusions and recommendations. If you're going to make recommendations, you do want to make sure that they align to best practices. So recommending a 72 character password for all users. Well, that's a fantastic security measure, especially if you manage to compromise a bunch of weak four character passwords or just alpha all uppercase character passwords. Yeah, you do want to recommend a longer password, but 72 characters, while might be really, really, really secure, is that an industry best practice? Is that what the competition is doing? Is that what other people that you've done this assessment for have in their environment and how did it stand up? Where maybe the industry recommendation is eight character passwords or 10 character passwords. Uh, maybe the industry standard is complex passwords. Maybe it isn't at the time that you're doing this. It's really important to have that, not necessarily that you just copy and paste this recommendation or that recommendation into your report, but oftentimes for specific recommendations, you'll get queries. Why did you recommend I have 72 character passwords? The wrong answer is I thought that up off top of my head while I was uh, thinking about some numbers and I had to multiply 36 times two. And uh, so I had this number 72 on my piece of paper while I was writing that. And so I just copied that in. That's not a good answer. You want your answers to have forethought, you want them to have predictability, and you want to be able to talk to them. On the presentation side, the presentation for your security assessment should follow typically the same flow as the document itself, but as an upper level. So you're not going to read a 90-page security assessment during your presentation. If you do, you should probably be thrown out of that company immediately. It's not all about just reading the conclusions or just reading the executive overview. It's about understanding who's in the room and then delivering the information, a summary of the information to that audience. So if you're talking to technologists, that's great. You want to ensure that you talk in more of a technical fashion. You want to provide a little bit more technical detail, but not worry about business impact as much or availability impact or, or market positioning. On the other side, if you're talking to the executive folks um, or upper level management folks, you do want to emphasize more business impact. You want to emphasize uptime, downtime, where these kinds of vulnerabilities put these folks uh, in terms of income. Not so much this switch should be said or this API should be called or this particular widget should be in place. They don't care about that so much. And finally, a lot of times the slides themselves are not deliverable meaning you can summarize in kind of an ad hoc way or the way that best conveys the information, but not really worrying so much about, I have to give them a copy of the deck as well as the actual document. If it's not part of the scope, if it's not defined in your deliverable list, then you're not delivering the slides. And I can't stress that enough because sometimes you will take the information from the written document and from your notes and synthesize that into summaries or into things that have slightly different context or slightly different wording on slides because you can't just put a wall of word on slides. Well, you can, but it's a bad idea. 
And occasionally a client will say, hey, I want the slides as well because you said it a little differently on the slide than you did in the written report, so I'd like to have both versions. If it's part of the scope, then you need to give that some forethought before you put the slide together, knowing that you're delivering that. If it's not part of the scope, the answer is, sorry, uh, this is actually not part of the scope. I just knocked this up for this presentation. You're, you've got the written report, which captures all of this data. So to briefly restate the pro tips in a, in a pro tips way here is ensure that everything you say on every slide, every piece of data, every conclusion, every, every point is in the documentation somewhere. Why? Because they're going to want to know where it is. They're going to ask questions. Well, you said this in this slide. I didn't see that in the written report. That's horrible. That's you, you failed. Ensure that they map closely. Certainly don't just copy and paste from the document and make that into slides and then present that or do not hand out the document and simply start reading from it. That's not really good. You are not James Earl Jones. You are not going to give them a book reading. Otherwise, you could just make it an MP3 and sell it to them as a book on tape. That's actually extraordinarily boring. What you're looking to do here is summarize, up-level, and present it in an engaging way and also in a way that allows them to ask probing questions where you might present, and I'll show you in a moment, you might present some data where they want to ask a little bit of refining detail or a little bit of, of kind of out of scope, but still appropriate questioning around that area. That's why you're in the room is to answer that kind of question. And then certainly knowing your audience, who is going to be in the room, knowing that you're talking to technologists, knowing that you're talking to managers, knowing that some people in the room were maybe targets of the attack. If you're presenting information around social engineering, if the people in your room were part of the social engineering attack, if they were targets for you, you need to be super, super careful, for example, on reporting the social engineering findings. Even without names, you're probably directly talking to those people in a way that's going to make them feel uncomfortable. Making them feel uncomfortable is not part of the engagement. So to demonstrate a presentation for Big Money Bank, our example scenario here, I've actually put together a few slides very much along the lines of what I would deliver in a meeting to mid-level executives and high-level executives on one specific area that I've tested. In these kinds of presentations, what I'll typically do is start by defining what the test is all about, because I don't assume that everyone in the room knows exactly what social engineering is or why I've done it. Then I'll explain a little bit about the tests I performed, and then finally, a summary of what I found based on those tests. Again, not assuming that these folks are hacking experts or security experts, not assuming they understand what any of this is, but not going into overboard details. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So for executives, I'll explain definition of social engineering right here. Is It's about talking to people and trying to get information out of them. So not touching any computers or any systems directly. It's about compromising assets by human interaction. These examples are really, really, really useful, and they should certainly adhere pretty closely to the types of attacks or the types of tests that you performed. Those examples up-level it a little bit, and you can get a little bit extemporaneous on the, so if you bump into Joe at the coffee shop and you ask Joe for some information about the company, did Joe give you the, the information or not? That's social engineering. I'll then get right into what the tests were that I performed. And I'll be a little bit more specific about what tests I performed. So for example, here I'll show that I did some eavesdropping, that I did some job posting examination and actually call downs based on that. And also that I called random employees and based on this scenario, this is what I did. Make sense? Because what it leads into is the results. So this gives me the tests, allows me to explain what I did, and then the summary of the findings is next. The summary of findings is, again, both balanced, positive, and negative. I found no secrets by eavesdropping. I went to the coffee shop, and I spent a lot of my own personal money on double tall, venti, latte, no foam, five splendas. And I got no secrets. And they like that because that relates to them. Puts them a little bit more at ease to hear that it's positive and that their people are doing a good job. 
and also no job search analysis results. I, I called some managers. I looked at a bunch of jobs to see if I could get some secrets about new projects or undisclosed stuff. Nothing there. They love hearing that as well. So starting usually with the positive and then yielding into the or, or merging into the I did some technical support calls. And here's what I found. Three users were uh, willing to give me their user ID and passwords. I got some information about wireless networks. I got some information about security and I got in some information about the data center. And I won't get into a ton of details. Notice here that I don't have the names of the users and that I specifically mentioned I did not verify the username and password combinations unless that was part of my, yep, you guessed it, scope. So it might not have been part of my scope to impersonate users and log into a network. It may have been, in which case this would be verified. The other information I probably have as part of a comprehensive penetration test anyway, so I might have verified them. Certainly, there are some that are easier to verify than others, and the folks in the room can decide to verify themselves or can decide we want you to come back and verify all of this or continue your examination and verify both what you got and what that means to our security posture. So it gives them a few different options, but it keeps it at a higher level. Oftentimes I'll get questions around how did you get this or how did you get that? How did you get, when, especially when it's a positive hit, how did you get the user ID and password? And I need to be ready with that information, but at the same time, I don't want to explain it in uh, excruciating depth considering that one of the people that is affected or was a positive result may be in the room or may be hearing this later, secondhand, thirdhand, in maybe a worse way. So being really cautious about up-leveling this, balancing the results, and delivering the results in a very neutral, not overly sterile way, but in a way that's not insulting or derogatory, those are key aspects of delivering this.